You're listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. This episode was made possible in part by the Emissary Author Workshops and our title of the week, The Hope of War, from Emissary Author Larry Cripps. Go to publishwithemissary.com forward slash workshops and thehopeofwar.com for more details. We're live once again with the Emissary Publishing Podcast with my friend and colleague, Paul Edwards. Paul, good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, Jason. Uh, Happy New Year as we're recording this on the second day of January in 2024. And boy, did we pick the right guest for a theme that we have been talking about amongst ourselves. We've had the opportunity to share it with some people. And now we get to share it with the audience. And that is the how many people we talk to who say, I want to write a book. And we say, yeah, no, you don't. (laughs) Yeah, the amount of effort that is required to produce a book it should not be underestimated. It is not for the faith of heart to not only go through the prep work and figuring out what message do I want to share, but then put in all the effort required uh, and and take away time and resources from something else that you might have been doing to then pu- write your book. But then even after you write your book, doesn't mean anybody cares. Yeah. And you got to go and market that book and make people aware of the message that you want to share. Otherwise, uh, that what, what was that? Was that? That old movie, we won't say the name. But if you build it, they will come. Turns out it's not necessarily true. And so we're excited to have Ryan James Miller on with us today. Ryan, welcome to the Emissary Publishing Podcast. What's up, guys? Happy New Year. It's good to be here. It's Miller time. Something like that. I'm like. (laughs) Well, the (laughs) the title of this podcast is Stop Wasting Your Time with Ryan James Miller. I'm intrigued. We talked very briefly before the show about what's on your mind. You, you've written a book and you exposed some secrets about how difficult that was, why people should maybe pause. Yeah, I guess I'll just uh, get right into it and let it fly. Um, you know, when I, when I set out, when I finally committed to writing this book or a book, uh, it was about three years ago. And at that time, one of the things that I was absolutely adamant that I would not do was write a book to create another business card for myself. That's what everybody said was, oh, it's a great business card. It's a great promotional tool. And I was like, look it, I don't need another business card. You know, like that, that just, that seems so pointless to me. Um, and anyway, so through a series of events, I committed to writing a book. Um, the book that I actually started writing, I wrote, uh, five and a half chapters of stopped, took about a, a month pause and then, uh, set out to write this book, which I did. And I just like, as I reflect back and, you know, even as we were talking offline right before, like one of the things that comes to mind for me is like, we, we only have like, it's so cliche, but we only have so much time in our life you know, and that's personally, professionally, uh, everything. And so why would you ever waste so much time writing something that you didn't absolutely love or fully invested into, completely cared about, and were willing to go literally to hell and back for? Mm. And I just feel like If you can't say yes, and I know this is just me and not everybody is like me, but if you can't say yes to to all of those things, I feel like you should never do it. There are so many better ways to spend your time, your money, uh, ways to market your business than to write a book if you're not going to be fully in it because it is just brutal. Mm. Yeah. So how about that? (laughs) (laughs) If you're speaking our language, really, because... Uh, I think some people, some people really should assess why they want to have a book out there in the first place. If you have a message to share, it doesn't mean you need a book to do it. There might be better ways to invest your time and effort. However, on the flip side of it, I found that people who've written books have a certain concentration to their concepts that people who have not written books are missing. They have, Mm. they have really, they have really gone through the hard work of distilling down what they want to say. What is really valuable 
and that concentration of of wisdom uh i think surpasses folks who've not gone through the effort of writing a book yeah 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 i mean you know so i briefly mentioned that i wrote five and a half chapters of a book closed that chapter and, and rewrote and that book was my co coaching philosophy so it was yeah. what you know a lot of people call a knowledge share it's like hey i'm going to give you the seven steps to you know, living the dream life, whatever it was. And the reason I stopped was I was really just praying through as I was writing the book and trying to just as best as I could hear from the Lord, like, what am I supposed to be doing here? And, and, and what's the purpose? And I got to this place of thinking to myself, like, this is so stupid. Mm. Everybody has access to this information. And as a matter of fact, if people don't buy into me, if they don't get connected to me and attached to me, then they're not going to care about anything else I say. I'm not, you know, a Brendan Burchard or a um, Oprah or somebody that's so recognizable. So it's like, I really have to give them a reason. And so as I started thinking about that reason, the reason always came back to my story. And I've lived a fairly interesting life. And most people are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But I'm like, Really, in 45 and change years, a lot's happened to me. I've been through a lot. And I thought, that's the story I need to tell is my story. Mm. And so, Jason, to your point, which was really interesting, was as I started writing, the reason really started to develop. And it was, it wasn't even as much telling my story because, again, like I'm just some random guy from Southern California. Nobody really cares to hear my story. But I started, the more I wrote, the more I realized that I was giving other people permission, particularly men, though that's not necessarily the intended audience, but giving people permission to be vulnerable in the mm. things that hurt the most, and yet that give us the greatest opportunity for growth and gain. Mm. And so that, that it's interesting that you said that because I haven't really articulated it like that before, but it was like, as I was writing, the purpose became more clear. And even now post publish and marketing it, it's becoming more and more and more clear, but it's really hard to figure that out oftentimes <laughs> until you get started in the process. Hmm. So you're coming now we've, we've encountered a, a, a few instances like this, right? Where what's the, the you know, whatever expertise and knowledge transfer you bring to an audience needs to be brought at them from a different angle than they might be expecting it, right? They're expecting it in the templated Brendan Burchard formula, Tony Robbins, whatever, right? Here's the six steps you need to do to do this. And now you're coming at them from an angle. No, this is who I am. And I also happen to do this, right? And they'll pick up on that through the story. And I think that that's really in print, especially that's the way you have to, in, a, in the, in the mark, in the noise of the marketplace today, where the, especially if you're an industry or a profession where lots of other people do what you do, how else are you going to stand out except through your personal story? And moreover, you've come at it from the angle of vulnerability, which is one of the things I've always admired the most about you in all the years that we've known each other, which, uh, which has a way, I think, uh, of, of connecting with the person that you would really want to work with anyway, because people don't have, that's one of my favorite sayings. I borrowed this from an old friend of mine. People don't have business problems. They have personal problems they bring into their business. And if they can't, if they don't have anywhere, they can be honest about it then they run into the, you know, up the creek without a paddle scenarios that are so common to, yep. to people who do well and achieve in, in business. And so I think, I think you're coming at it from a, the kind of angle that we would encourage one of our authors to do. And in fact, that Jason, we've done that with a couple of people that we've spoken to. Well, and, and to your point, something that I think is really important in the midst of that, that you said, again, I think this is where keeping on even theme with this specific episode, I think that we can completely waste our effort, effort and energy by trying to put 
a new spin on something old because we want to stand out. Mm. And so it, it, it's, you know, you guys know this and Paul, I know you specifically have been doing this for a long time, but like this idea of branding is so dangerous because on one hand, we all kind of sound and look like everybody else, right? I mean, we get into a lane, we get into a niche and we kind of all sound the same. And yet Steve Martin, the comedian once was quoted as saying, be so good. You can't be ignored. And I try to think to myself, like, even as I was writing, like what, what's different, what, what's really going to make me stand out. Yeah. And for me, it went back to, and maybe not everybody in your audience is going to relate to or agree with this. And that's totally okay. But I believe that every single one of us has been uniquely created by God and wired in such a way that even though in many ways we share similar themes, ideas, beliefs, whatever, there is something unique about every single one of us. And so Mm -hmm. I think that that is the important thing to bring into whatever story you're trying to tell, whatever book you're trying to write, whatever concept you're trying to share. It's like we all would read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and say, okay, all seven of those habits can apply to my life, my business, whatever. But If I was to write that, I would write that differently than he did. Not as good for sure, but I would write that differently because I have different life experience and because I'm wired differently and I have different passions and I have different purpose. And so I think that's what's important, which requires, this is a plug for you guys though, you know, whatever. It's just like, you have to go to a professional that can help to extract that because I think too often we're too blind to truly understand our unique value proposition in the midst of that story we're trying to tell. And as a result, we end up just trying to put a different spin on something old. And again, it just becomes a total waste of time because all it is is just another version of something that's been written 700 times before. Yeah. I think one of the things that stands out for me from what we're talking about here is music is highly subjective. Mm. Right now, if I, if I want to listen to music to relax, there's a certain type of music I listen to relax too, right? It tends to be soft. Uh, if I'm looking to, to zone out, I might listen to something without words because my mind gets all confused by the words. And now I'm off <laughs> thinking of this stuff instead of thinking about the thing it's supposed to work, work on. If I want to get to, if I really want to work on, you know, get to work on something, program something, write something, I'll listen to some techno probably just like some with a beat no words. If I want to jam out in my house, I might listen to some hip hop. Now, if I were to take that experience into my parents' house, for instance, and surround some hip hop, because, you know, we're making some food, my dad would probably throw me out because we each have our own subjective, uh, things that we engage in, right? Things that we like, and it's neither good nor bad. And so when we take, like you talk about these old principles and bring them into our personal experience, there is a connection that I have to perhaps old principles, which is going to be uniquely different. Like we're talking about from somebody else's connection as uniquely different as our likes in music. I might hate your like in music and I might hate the way you say, you know, some given principle, I might completely disagree with your lived experience of that principle, even though it's your lived experience and you might completely disagree with mine. And we come to these, I think, old principles. And this is the second thing I want to talk about. The, the, we come to these old principles, which are, um, there, they are in one sense, objectively true, and then subjectively lived out. One of those is the early bird gets the worm. We might all agree to that, right? We might also agree with good things come to those who wait. <laughs> Both of those are, a, are true, but subjectively lived out. You cannot always be the early word sometimes, or, you know, early bird. Sometimes that's a terrible idea. You cannot always, you're not always going to get good things just because you wait. So this, this idea of subjectivity, even old principles feel brand new sometimes. And we engage with these old principles. From based on somebody's unique viewpoint, unique delivery, unique working out of those principles. And I, and so I think, you know, Ryan, one of the, one of the things I see in your work is that you, you might have these old principles, but you live them out in a unique way. And someone else, someone is going to uniquely attach to your voice and hear you 
when they will not hear somebody else and their unique delivery of it or their unique life experience of it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's super duper good. And you know, one thing I try to be really careful of myself is we live in a society today where we're always looking for the newest, latest, greatest thing. And there are definitely some new technologies and ideas out there that are super helpful to us. But I've really tried to go back to the quote unquote basics of things. And so again, I think it's so important that while I'm trying to put my spin or tell my story, that I'm not avoiding the simplicity of what I'm trying to communicate. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to avoid the basic principle or the old school style. Again, like I referenced Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. Most people don't even know who Stephen Covey is or what that book is. If you were to ask them, like, what is the most popular book on habits? Most people would say Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I'd say that's a fantastic book. I really love that book. I love the way James Clear writes. And yet, if you read it, you're going to read most of Covey's principles restated in Clear's voice. And so it's like, we don't always have to go to the new thing. And so again, like as I was writing, that was one thing that um, my team was super helpful with me on was just wrangling me back in. Like, just tell the story. Don't overdo the an analogy. Don't over tell the, you know, share the concept. Just communicate. Yeah. And what I was really proud of, and, and not everybody can do this, and that's totally fine, but I wrote it myself. And I'm not a great writer. Um, at least I don't think so. But I use my voice. It was the way I communicate. It was the, you know, like it was my experience. And so I didn't want anybody else to be writing my experience for me. And so again, it just, it, it reminded me back to this idea of like, I just have to, to just, just tell it the way that it is. And there's got to be things that people are like, oh, I've read that before. Oh, I know that before. Like one of the most challenging feedback I got from the book was I had a client, she reached out to me afterwards and she goes, oh my gosh, she goes, I can't believe it. She says, I read your book in one night. Mm -hmm. And I was like, gosh, what a waste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I spent all this time, effort and energy and this person spent their hard-earned money and their time and they got through this whole thing in a couple of hours. Like there must not have a lot of been a, a lot been a lot of value in that. And, and and it must not have been as powerful as I had hoped it would be that somebody could just get through it that fast. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, that's not the point. Like my point was to tell my story and hopefully it made an impact and come to find out later on, we would, we would have a conversation and she talked about all the ways that it impacted her and all the things that it did. So again, it was like, I don't, I don't need to overdo this. I don't, I don't need to make it bigger than it is. I just need to be and to do as I'm called to. And through that, you know, the, the right impact is going to happen. Mm. Our, um, our newest author this year, we're working through finishing up his uh, manuscript right now and his unique story is having served in every major u.s conflict from vietnam to afghanistan not many Whoa. people can say that and what's become so fun about this uh, as the editor right as the person looking over this and he's doing the writing it's in his voice you know um but we're he's he's able to take examples that you can look at in history in history that for most of at least for our generation is still pretty fresh right it's not one not many years before all of us were born and stuff we grew up hearing about and learning about he's able to point to these macro scale versions of the same journey that he went through as a just a private in the army or you know a sailor in the in the navy and tie them together or using these you know, those core principles that you ran up against. And so what we, we encouraged him towards that. He said, yeah, you got to know, um, what are the things that you've run up against in life? You've either instinctively cooperated with them and they've worked, or you've banged your head against the wall enough times that you gave up and surrendered to it. 
And there's just a million different ways to spin that, but the, the, the context is what makes it so interesting to read about because you hear him in the one moment he's describing mistakes made by the president of the United States. And then the next minute he's saying, and I made the same mistake and let me tell you how, you know? <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it's wonderful when you start to, when, when it becomes clear to you what really sticks out and matters and can be taken from one person, like, like a flame on a candle to the next, and they can still use it. And you draw them towards that principle mm. with your authentic story, the background that only you could have lived through and no one else can tell quite the way you do with the detail and the perspective that you held about it at the time, maybe versus how you, especially if you, if you think about it differently now. Yeah. Well, and I think to something you said, it just makes, it, 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 it makes me, or it reminds me that that's why working with the right people to do this is also so important. Again, like I think sometimes people enter into this and they think to themselves, like, I'm going to do this as cheaply as possible because I just, I need to get it out there. And again, I think that just goes back to the theme, like what a waste, you know, you don't have to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars clearly, but I think it requires the right, no, I don't think, I know that it requires the right team to help guide the author in the right direction mm -hmm. because you guys bring a level of experience around how it reads, how it's received, what the structure looks like. And again, mm -hmm. these are things that 99.9% .9 of the population don't think about. I mean, I have been publicly, professionally speaking now for 20 years. I've spoken well over a thousand different times. And so communication is not a problem for me, but the structure of writing is mm -hmm. and, and, and formatting a story in such a way that it will, uh, it will be succinct across an entire book from chapter to chapter. And I think, again, those are the things that, that most people don't consider how you transition from the end of one chapter into the next one, especially when you're storytelling, which obviously, you know, almost every book is. And so those again, were things to me that I thought about, but I didn't really think about. And mm -hmm. I was so fortunate to have a team of people that were helping guide me because I remember I wrote my first draft and they called it a vomit draft. And it was just, you know, 52,000 words or something like that. That was just like, blah. Right. And then I got my first bit of feedback and it was like, okay, so how is this going to be structured? <laughs> and, you know, you, you're going to tell your story because the way my, my book is laid out is I tell the story. There's kind of nine pivotal moments in my life. I tell a story of that season of my life. And through some of that, I'm kind of sharing, you know, the, the, the learning lesson as it was happening. But at the end of every chapter, is a reflection back onto why that, what happened, why that happened and how I learned and grew from it. Mm. And, and, but I didn't think of that. They did, you know, I, I was just going to tell the story and kind of conclude with uh, so you get it. <laughs> and, right, yeah. and, and, they, and, and, you know, and the feedback I got was no, 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 you, you need to give them a wrap on your story, but you also need to give them something to chew on apart from just reading a good story. And, you know, some of like probably one of my favorite present day memoirs that's been written, uh, was can't hurt me by David Goggins mm -hmm. and, um, and the way that he wrote that book and told the story and provided anecdote and lesson and analogy all throughout was so phenomenal, but then he would also finish with such a practical landing place at the end of each chapter that transitioned into the next. Mm -hmm. And so again, I just, I think these things are so important and they're often overlooked. And I'm afraid that in a day of AI and ease of access to information and technology, that those things are going to be missed. And so we already see so much garbage out on the internet in terms of just content and garbage of books. I mean, just the number of books written every single year is absurd to me. 
But I think it's only going to get worse because people are trying to cut corners to get their quote unquote business card out there. And they're going to, again, just waste. I mean, even if they only spent 500 bucks, which I don't even know if you could do that, but what a waste of money and what a waste of time. And then what a waste of promotion. And mm. just, I don't know, just, it, it, it just seems like it's going to get worse. Well, the tagline for Emissary Publishing is we tell the stories that matter. And the other side of that coin is that not every story matters and we're not afraid to parse that out. Uh, because to your point, you know, there's a lot of people want to say a lot of things and whether they should be said or not is up for, up for, uh, I, I guess some subjectivity, but I I want to, I want to go back to a statement you made very briefly. You just like threw it into a sentence there that circles back around with the title is to stop wasting your time. You said, you said something about your called to and and i think that in these messages that matter for folks who desperately want to say something how do you know how did you know that you weren't wasting your time with this book how did you know that you were quote unquote called to what were the criteria that you said i got it i i really do need to share this this is this is a story worth telling Ooh, man, let me, let me try and <laughs> narrow that down a little bit because it could get lengthy. But uh, so uh, a, a few people may know, Paul does know. Um, but so kind of like the catalytic event for me was my wife and I and five of our friends were in the crowd in Las Vegas when the mass shooting happened back in 2017. One of our friends was one of the 58 killed that night. Mm-hmm. And so on the back end of that, uh, I was pastor of a church at the time. I was coaching and speaking. And so I was out there in the public a lot and I was getting asked over and over again, like, you know, more about what happened and the story. And then people started saying, Hey, you need to write a book. And I said, absolutely not. I said, I am not going to write a book that profits off the back of my friend that was killed. The other 57 people that were killed the thousand people that were injured or the 22,000 people that will have their lives wrecked forever in one way or another. I just, I'm not going to do it. And it took three years, three years for me to even entertain the idea of beginning to tell that story. And so that was, I guess, confirmation. Number one was I fought against it for so long before I was even willing to give it a chance. Mm. Secondly, so, um, I, I, again, like this, this loses a few people, but if my life, if God creates me personally, Ryan Miller, if God creates me with intention and purpose to go out and live a life that he calls me to, to impact specific people, to serve my wife and my kid, whatever, if he does that, that, then that, then that means that every single moment of my life has worth and value. There's meaning. And for me specifically, as I started to consider the most valuable moments in my life, they were all these wounds, these tragic events, either things that I did, my own gambling, near infidelity on my wife, um, or wounds that were done to me. Things like my parents' divorce, uh, Route 91, um, just so many other things. And so I thought to myself, I've got to make good on all these awful moments. Mm. Like there, there's no way that God was wasting moments of my life. Like they hurt, they suck. Some of them I'm still not completely healed from. And so if, if there's purpose and intention and I don't want to waste any moment, then I need to do something with it. Mm. And so that was part of that. Stop writing the knowledge share book and, and shift to the memoir was I need to tell this story again, not because I'm like, I don't matter. I just, I don't I mean, want to, you know, a, a billion people in this world or whatever, but there's something in the story that's going to matter to somebody else that's worth sharing this with. Mm. And so, and so that's, that's what led me into it. But I want to say this too, still now, I mean, I published in September, so we're four months removed from that. I still question all the time whether, whether I did it right or not. Like, you know, I, we, we sold 
a decent number of books, a couple hundred books day one. And, um, you know, I think we've sold about 700 to this point, which is good for us. You know, again, nobody, no name. And I've booked some speaking gigs off of it, which has been super cool. And I've got some great feedback. There's still these moments that I just keep thinking to myself, like, was it really worth it? I mean, in total, um, most people don't know this, but my publisher went bankrupt um, six weeks before I was set to publish. They took me for $30,000. So all in this book cost me about $50,000 just to get across the finish line. And now marketing since then, it's cost me well over 10000 more. So like I- I'm into this book way, way more. And it cost me so much distraction in my business and so many other things. And so again, like it was just all these questions, but again, to answer your question, the call is confirmed when I get a message a a week ago from some stranger, literal stranger that says that they were on the verge of divorce and reading my story allowed him to be vulnerable enough to go to his wife and admit that he has not been the husband that she deserves. And he's going to do whatever it takes mm-hmm. to reinvigorate the 14 year marriage that they had. So he does not lose his wife and his kid. And so I don't think we always get that call and that confirmation from the moment that we decide to write. I did like, I, I felt like it, like I was going in the right direction, but I think it's that constant affirmation over long periods of time, which again goes back to, you you better really mean what you're about to say. You you better have really good purpose and intention for the story that you want to write because you're going to battle for days, weeks, months, years, whatever, around whether or not you made the right decision. Mm. And you may not ever monetarily get back what you invested into it. You may never get the hundreds or thousands of hours, but for every bit of feedback that I get from somebody that says like, I, 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 I turned away from my addictions because I read that you did at one point in your life or like this gets, and this gets me really emotional or the marriage story. Like I nearly slept with another woman and threw away my marriage Mm -hmm. four years into my own marriage. And so to read that somebody made a similar decision just because of reading my stupid story, like it's so insignificant and yet it means the world to me. Yeah. And so that to me is just the grace of God in reminding me moment by moment, hopefully for the rest of my life, that everything that I gave, gave over and all the sacrifices that I made to not just ex- the experience, but actually writing that it was worth it. Yeah. One of the sayings that I uh, really love is when's the best time to plant a tree? Mm. The answer is 20 years ago. And I look at sometimes the things that we uh, invest in, perhaps like writing a book, a story that we think needs to be told. We plant that tree, we give that message to the world, and then we don't know where it goes necessarily from there. We do it with the intent, I think, of using that message, of of believing that message is somehow going to grow into, much like a tree, is going to grow into giving us shade in our yard years from now. But if we don't plant it, it's guaranteed to not grow. It's guaranteed to go nowhere. And, And so I look at sometimes these things that matter to us. We have to believe at some point that there is something bigger that will grow out of this and much like you look at our insignificant sometimes laughable sometimes you know horrifically uh unwise decisions and trust that these are going to be used years from now as we tell them it's going to be used to give somebody else shade it's going to be used to better it now, we don't know after we give it to the world, we don't know what happens with it. Maybe that whole tree gets plowed down. Maybe it dies. Maybe it, you know, maybe it does continue to grow and somebody else enjoys it for years to come. But if we don't, if we don't plant that tree, nothing's going to happen from it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I, I think, you know, you may not have thought about this for a while, right? But of course you were instrumental in doing for me what you did for those people who read your book, right? Mm -hmm. The mastermind we were at in LA a couple of years ago, and you drew to my attention that I had uh, failed to be the kind of husband that I really could be. And then I went home and put my hand to the plow. And before you could look around, I was having the happiest season of all time, which goes on to this day mm. in my marriage. All, all I see here is two different versions of the same story. One occurred in person. The other one occurred in print, <laughs> which is to say, right. You, you, you still wonder if it was the right thing to do. I I'm reminded of another <laughs> saying from a fictional character, but from the same region as the, as the, uh, the one Jason quoted, and that's Mr. Miyagi saying, if it comes from inside, always the right one, right? Always the right thing if it comes from inside. And it does. It comes from a very deep, profound place in your soul. Um, now, you know, we, there's, there's, of course, the, the tendency of the market to misunderstand what you're up to, to place their own measuring stick on that. Say, well, it didn't sell as many copies as... Uh, as, as, uh, as the Harry Potter series, I, <laughs> yeah, I know that I understand that, but that's, that's really not a useful measuring stick for what we're talking about here. Um, because we we're, we're talking again, you're, you're in on the same sheet of music as we are. We're talking about the stories that matter mm -hmm. and, uh, fiction can do a great job of dramatizing stories that matter, but real life are, is the story. Yeah. This didn't, wasn't just a figment of some person's imagination. It really happened. And if it, and, and if there's something that can be gleaned from that and passed on like the, like the flame on the candle, it can't possibly be wrong. Yeah. Possibly have made the wrong choice. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the other helpful, uh, gifts I was given uh, when I started to write early on, and again, I think this is so important, is um, I was asked what my goal was in writing the book. Mm -hmm. And it was so helpful because, again, on one hand, like, I want to sell a million copies. God only knows how that would happen. But, like, I would love to do that. And I would love to be, you know, featured on every talk show talking about what happened and my, whatever, like I, I want it all. I want, I want all of that stuff that that's, that's just fits into my whole dream of a platform and presence and, you know, impact and whatever, but that's not real. Mm. At least that's not realistic that, that we can still dream about that stuff, but that's not realistic. And so what, what they really helped me do was uh, I was helped to pare it down to a couple of key things. And one of those was how, how do you want this to help impact your business? And so I, I was able to articulate that. Uh, one was how does this, how do you want this to help you grow as an individual? I, I was able to articulate that. And then probably the coolest one was they asked us, uh, I was asked, um, what, what is the champagne moment? And I was like, what? And they said, what is the moment after you published your book? in which you would break out the champagne for. And mm. so immediately, right, you go to those like big high markers and they're like, nope, we want to take all those away. You get one moment. What is one thing that will happen to you as the result of writing this book that you will say, I did it. Mm. And I am not joking. My champagne moment was fulfilled when I got that message from that random stranger about his marriage. It, it was literally almost verbatim as if God heard every word that I spoke and was just waiting for the moment through all the hardship, through all the frustration, through the loss, through the anger, through the dark moments of I'm quitting and I'm not even going to finish this. Mm. And he was like, now here you go. Break out the champagne. Yeah. And I cannot encourage people enough. Like dream big, Go, like reach for the most amazing heights possible with whatever you're going to write for yourself. 
But at the end of the day, think about that moment that will really confirm in your heart that I did it. Mm. And whatever you call that, that to me is so critical because it is, it, it's one of those tools that it allows us to not get caught up in the, I've got to do this for somebody else. I've got to make this really big. I've got to match these yeah. people. Um, again, I still want all those things, but what I really want is what matters most. And so something like that was just so helpful. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Good way to wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, right. If, even if you were to get all those things, if now you have to put on a big dog and pony show, mm -hmm. keep it going. How exhausting would that be? How demoralizing would it be to reach the top and realize that the only reason you got there was by playing the, playing the dog and pony show and doing the dance and all that. And the world isn't really interested in the real you. They're interested in the fake you. Yep. Yeah. Can't keep that for very long. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather be, I'd rather be in poverty. Yeah. So the book is called wounds, Rye. Where do we send people? What's the quickest route to pick up a copy? Uh, woundsbook.com, W O U N D S B O O K.com. You can go there, grab a copy of the book. Um, check out some of the other stuff that we're doing as the result of that. Uh, yeah, that, that's the best place to go. And if you're thinking about, uh, a compelling presenter or speaker at your event, I, as a personal witness of Ryan's, uh, dynamism on stage, I, heartily encourage you to consider hiring him to speak at your next event. Ryan, maybe we'll have you out whenever we do one of our workshops in LA and, uh, would love to, would love to see you again soon when you're out in the desert. And, uh, that's about all we got for this week. My name is Paul Edwards. My co-host is Jason Todd. We are emissary publishing telling the stories that matter for faith-based founders and executives. We will see you on the next episode.